Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. At the NEAEP symposium, I probably turned to three or four people sitting around me and said, I want to have Dr. Van Epps on my podcast. His talks are just so interesting and engaging and so relevant to what we as hoof care practitioners see day in and day out with laminated courses. I actually chased after him out of the room after one of his talks and asked if he would be on the podcast and he agreed. How I usually start this is I just ask you to start by saying your name and your profession. Okay. My name is Andrew Van Epps, and I am a veterinary internal medicine specialist uh, in large animals with a research focus in laminitis, and I'm uh, currently an associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And can you tell us a little about your journey into laminitis research and how it became a focus of yours? I kind of ended up in it a little by accident, I guess. So when I was a veterinary student, I started working with a... um, a veterinarian who was on the racetrack, and um, I worked for him for two or three years, mucking stalls and holding horses and and, uh, learning a fair bit. And he, uh, at the end of it, offered me a job, uh, kind of an internship, I guess, but on the condition that I I do some research at the same time. And as a veterinary student, I was lucky enough to have Chris Pollitt, who was a real legend in the laminitis research uh, sphere as a professor and a, and a teacher. And he was he would come into our classroom every year and he'd sort of tell us to throw out last year's notes because everything had changed. And so he was very active and was kind of turning the, the whole laminitis research world on its head at that point. And so my uh, boss in practice said I should go on and do some research with him. So I turned up and told him that I'd like to do some research and that I was really interested in navicular, doing something in navicular disease. And he kind of sort of said, okay, but then came back later and said, why don't you, why don't you do some laminitis stuff? And that's how, that's how I started. And I started off doing kind of a a part-time master's degree and it turned into a PhD. And and then later down the track, it's sort of become my focus. Yeah. And I was able to see you speak at the NEAEP symposium. And I just, I loved all your talks. Obviously, you're a super engaging presenter and shared some really interesting research and information. So I know it would be tough to, you know, recap those hours of of talks that you gave, but I thought we could touch on a few of the things that you said. Sure. Um, So could you talk a little bit about the three types of laminitis? Yeah. So we, we now recognize that laminitis is different depending on the kind of underlying cause. And the three types that we recognize are, firstly, the horse that's putting too much load on one limb uh, because they have a fracture or some sort of painful condition in the other limb, and that's uh, supporting limb laminitis. And that's the kind of laminitis that affected horses like Barbaro. And that type of laminitis is not particularly common, but it does cause us issues in that we often don't, even though we have the expertise to correct or treat some pretty serious fractures and other problems with the horse leg, a lot of these horses get euthanized simply because we have grave concern about them even during recovery developing laminitis in the opposite limb. So that's kind of the importance of that of that problem. The other type of laminitis that we see in hospital environments often is called uh, sepsis-related laminitis, which occurs in horses that have systemic disease, that have diarrhea or pneumonia or uh, retained fetal membrane sometimes after birth is another common cause. These are horses that have fever and toxemia and then tend to develop fairly severe laminitis and we see that perhaps in maybe up to a quarter of those types of cases can develop some laminitis. So it's reasonably reasonably common amongst sick horses but uh, it's not the most common form of laminitis. The, com- the most common form of laminitis is associated with underlying endocrine problems and specifically problems with the regulation of insulin. So these are overweight horses sometimes, but sometimes not. Often 
grazing, pasture that might be higher in sugar. Sometimes these horses have underlying Cushing's disease, PPID, as they get older, and that sometimes pushes them over the edge. Uh, we call that group of horses, we call that kind of endocrine-associated laminitis. Uh, so that's the most common reason horses and ponies seem to get laminitis around the world. It's because they have an underlying problem with the regulation of their insulin and they're consuming too much carbohydrate-rich feed. Yeah, and the rest of my questions are going to kind of be based on what I pulled from from listening to you talk at the symposium. So if I have anything that's not quite, like if I didn't really understand it correctly, feel free to correct me. And Sure. Because <laughs> um, I, I was writing notes, you know, for, you know, as fast as I could, but... <laughs> Awesome. So I know when you were talking about the supporting limb laminitis, you spent a long time discussing your research into load cycling and perfusion. Um, And can you expand a little on that and how that relates to supporting limb laminitis? Yeah. So for for a long time, we kind of thought, well, and when, when I joined the laminitis research world 20 years ago, laminitis was just one problem and it was all about low blood flow. You know, it was all... Uh, an ischemic problem, blood perfusion issue. And I guess Chris Pollard was questioning that and, and that was what was kind of exciting about what he was doing at the time. And now we sort of have realized that the other two forms, the sepsis related and the endocrine form, aren't about that at all. They're not about low blood flow. But the question mark was still on this support limb form you know, we we suspect, and there's been a little bit of evidence over the years that putting load on a limb, when a horse puts the load on the limb and the, and and they're actually bearing weight on it, that the blood flow through, particularly to the parts of the corium, the lamella corium, the soft tissue in the foot, that blood flow is compromised and and not complete uh, when they're bearing weight on that limb. But the evidence hasn't been particularly good. But we still suspect that this support limb laminitis problem is is probably due to low blood flow. So yeah, the reason I'm here at, back at University of Pennsylvania is really because of an endowment uh, gift from the owners of Barbaro, who was a horse that succumbed to this form of laminitis. So we've really set set out on a mission to try to work out why that happens. So we focus a lot now on the support limb form and, and we've really focused down on how load affects blood flow through the larger vessels that supply the foot but more importantly through the little tiny capillaries which actually bring the nutrients to the tissue itself. So we've attacked this from a couple of different angles. We've used um, some imaging studies, so uh, CAT scans and the like in cadaver limbs but also in live horses looking at how load affects blood flow through the larger vessels and what it's been telling us is that as horses increase the amount of load, even just square standing load up to standing on one leg type of load and then up to the kind of load that they would experience uh, cantering or galloping on a lead leg, there's progressive reductions in the or cut off in the blood flow through the larger arteries as they increase that load. And then the other way we've looked at it is by, by having a little probe in the tissue itself, looking at the local supply of of energy, of glucose, and how that's metabolized. And what that's shown us is that if they put too much load on the limb for too long, it does seem to affect their uh, energy supply and their energy balance within the foot and the blood flow through those tiny little vessels. And then recently, we started to look at that by... Uh, getting uh, cadaver limbs off horses that have been uh, that have either died or been put down for other reasons here at the hospital, and we take those limbs and we perfuse them with a almost like a jelly solution that contains an ink marker, and then we can subject those limbs to different loading conditions. And when we what we see is that we can't get fill in those little capillaries that actually supply the the most important tissue, our lamellae. We can't get fill in those little capillaries unless the the load is actually cycled on and off. And what that's telling us is that horses, in essence, need to walk or at least uh, unload and load their limbs to get normal blood perfusion through those little vessels that supply that tissue. And I think we're zeroing in on 
why supporting them laminitis occurs. We think it's that they're just not doing enough of this cyclic loading. And then that's helping us start to design ways to prevent this problem in horses that are at risk. And that's kind of exciting for us. Yeah, and you mentioned in one of your talks that it might be important to do some careful walking with some horses that are on rest in order to to help that perfusion. Is that true? Yeah, it's really stunning to me. You know, in some of these experiments that we've done, we've noticed that it's, you know, not necessarily even increased load, but it's kind of detrimental for horses just to stand around very stagnant for too long. So what I guess I'm starting to feel is that Controlled walking, hand walking for horses uh, in different stages of, of uh, even of, of laminitis is probably not a bad thing. But saying that, horses that are having an acute episode of laminitis that are very painful when it's new, you know, I think it's probably still the lesser of two evils to make sure that they, um, you know, that they don't do too much walking around because that's what, what really damages that tissue when it's weakened. So there's probably a balance in there somewhere. Yeah. And I know when you were talking, I think you were talking about sepsis and sort of like colitis related laminitis. Was that the kind of laminitis that you focused on with the cryotherapy? Yeah, exactly. So we, when we developed the cryotherapy, which is just, it's just cooling of the distal limb, we initially were using it as a method to, or testing it as a method to prevent laminitis in horses that uh, were sick. And we've now done a, a range of studies over the last 10, 10 to 15 years that have you know, it's really withstood the rigor of, of multiple evaluations experimentally, but also in clinical trials. So the cooling does appear to prevent laminitis in these cases, and it also does seem to, to prevent the progression of laminitis in horses that already have some signs of, of lameness. How does it work is the big question, and we don't really sure. It has mm-hmm. cooling has a multitude of, of effects. It's it's complicated, and it has effects on inflammation. It, it reduces blood flow. It reduces the metabolic requirements of the tissues so that it doesn't need as much energy delivered. Doesn't need as much blood flow, and it also has effects on specific growth factor signaling pathways and other things that probably affect how cells, the cells down there behave and how their their connections with each other, uh, how the d- dynamics of those connections uh, are changed. So it is a focus of ours now to try to work out why and how the cooling works because the cooling is, is not practically easy to do. It's, you know, the, the cooling has to be constant and we're talking kind of ice and water immersion of the limb up to the level of the kind of upper cannon type area for you know two or three days plus sometimes in a in a row so it's it's well tolerated by horses but it's practically difficult to do so we really are keen to zero in on what aspects of it are important in preventing or help preventing progression of the lesion and try to mimic those effects with a drug treatment would be really ideal so that's where we're at with with that at the moment yeah, and I know you had mentioned that you should really start icing at the very onset of laminitis. And is it helpful if you don't start icing right away, or does it really not help at all after that point? Right. So ideally, we're, we're doing it as a preventative in, in sick horses, but we have shown experimentally at least that if you cool even after the first signs of lameness, that it can have a quite dramatic effect in preventing progression of the lesion. So, you know, it's it makes sense as a first aid treatment. And it makes sense as a first aid treatment for sepsis-related, so sick horse-type laminitis, but also for horses that have, you know, that have an underlying endocrine problem. So the horse or pony that's been out on pasture that has a new acute episode of laminitis, you know, a flare, uh, it's reasonable uh, to uh, use foot cooling as a first aid measure in that type of case. Hi, I'm speaking to you from Australia and I'm Professor Chris Pollock and I currently have retired from the academic side of my life at the University of Queensland 
at the veterinary school where I was the lecturer in equine medicine for the last 30 years. So currently I'm still very active in the laminitis research field. I have colleagues like Andrew Van Epps and uh, others where I'm assisting with postgraduate training. Andrew Van Epps and I have had now a long working relationship for several decades, I guess, and he was an undergraduate student of mine when I was lecturing equine medicine. Not a particularly attentive one, I must admit, but he has the uncanny ability to come first in his class whenever he's at an examination. So a couple of years after he graduated, he was in practice at a, in a Brisbane practice, a race course or equine practice nearby. And I got a, uh, probably an email first and then a knock on the door. And Andrew came in and uh, said he wanted to do postgraduate work because his boss at the equine practice had made it a prerequisite of his continued employment. And he told me just recently when I was visiting, what, only a couple of weeks ago in Pennsylvania, that he initially wanted to work on navicular disease. And uh, I said, well, you know, we'll do navicular disease after we've sorted out laminitis. So he started on laminitis. And at that stage, I just discovered the new carbohydrate overload model using a special sugar called oligofructose, which is uh, one of the fructans that occurs in pasture. So we were able to induce laminitis, the septic uh, laminitis model, with Andrew was involved in the early trials of that, and that led to being able to induce laminitis relatively easily and quickly and humanely. And then we were able to try an idea that I had about cooling the distal limb to prevent laminitis and uh, sure enough that did work wonderfully well and uh, if anything Alicia and your audience if I can look back over 35 years probably this distal limb cooling has made the most impact around the world with laminitis emergency therapy. You know, it's an excellent and very, very effective proven first aid measure for stopping laminitis in its tracks. Of course, it doesn't repair the anatomical catastrophe that occurs if laminitis is allowed to progress to the chronic, painful, bone damaging stage. But wherever I travel now, I was in Brazil just a few months ago, and I asked about cryotherapy there. And it's almost like Andrew and I have been forgotten as the originators of that, because now everybody else has adopted it, which is great. And it's just now routine in practices all over the world. So one thing that I wanted to mention at the start of my discussion with Dr. Van Epps was where I was coming from. I talked candidly with him about how really my knowledge is just from the ECIR group and their findings and recommendations. So my experience outside of what they might do is limited. Dr. Van Epps was super gracious in answering my questions and what he sees in his research, which allowed me to hear about what other work is being done and how they're making gains in laminitis prevention and recovery. I, I have sort of seen some of it, ECIR things, Eleanor, Helen. Yeah, a lot of it's not unreasonable for sure. And the message is, is about early diagnosis of underlying insulin dysregulation and management of that with, with feed and other things. So it's a perfectly reasonable approach for sure. But we certainly stay stay on top of what's going on Yeah, in that absolutely. sphere. So to go back to the endocrinopathic, you know, the metabolic type laminitis. Yeah. So how can owners and veterinarians make sure they're getting the right diagnosis? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I think the oral sugar test is for most horses and ponies <laughs> at risk, considered at risk. There's there's probably two types of animal there. So there's there's the horse or pony that's of a particular breed that we would consider high risk and that might include, you know, Welsh ponies or Morgans or, you know, pretty much everything, I guess, except maybe a thoroughbred and a standard bred, uh, to be honest. Thoroughbreds and standard breds are probably not considered high risk. I guess the other group is overweight animals, for sure. 
So uh, overweight animals can always benefit from testing in that sphere. And I, I mean, the I, oral sugar test is the way to go. So. Yeah, <laughs> I know. And that's actually why I asked. I was the one who asked the question in one of your sessions about if you've ever seen the oral sugar test induce laminitis. It's quite so, a small amount of sugar. And yeah. yes, they can spike a pretty high insulin. But, you know, and, and yes, horses can get laminitis, you know, uh, in with the, with a time association to the oral sugar test because the, you know the, the horses that are prone to laminitis <laughs> that you're sugar testing. But have I ever seen it? No, I haven't. Would it surprise me? No, not necessarily. Would I still do it? Absolutely, every single time. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, even if it it could push a horse uh, or a pony, you know, even by chance, if it if it pushed them over the edge or uh, uh, the information is still more important. And what's happening underneath is, you know. Put it this way, as horses with this problem, every day, if, if they're getting enough insulin from that little bit of oral sugar to damage their feet, then that's happening every day, multiple times a day. Do you know what yeah, I mean? It's yeah. it's happening all the time. These are just adding up, adding up, adding up. So you need that information, and it should never persuade people the risk of... It's, I don't think that's a, it's a reasonable... It's not a reasonable philosophy. Yeah. And so do you think, you know, it's it's better just to have that concrete diagnosis than just treating the horse as if they had insulin dysregulation? Absolutely. You need the diagnosis. You need the information. And for too long, we've not had that information. And there's two reasons. I mean, one, you know, a lot of these fat horses, are, you know, they're not necessarily uh, insulin dysregulated. You know, and some of them are truly insulin resistant, just need to lose weight. Others, um, you know, other horses and ponies are not overweight. They're not necessarily, they don't look like high-risk animals, but they have massive insulin responses to oral sugar, but their baseline insulin is completely normal. So they're the ones that are really important to catch with this type of testing, and they can benefit a lot from management and drug changes, particularly around, around feeding. So the information is everything for these cases. Yeah. And then besides the oral sugar test, the other thing to test for early and catch early is Cushing's disease, which is PPID, past pituitary intermediate dysfunction, uh, but we call it Cushing. It's important to start testing horses and ponies probably from about 10 years of age. And if they've got signs of early laminitis or, or uh, you know, even even maybe from about eight It's not worth testing them earlier than that, really, because your chances that a positive could be false get much higher in in younger animals because the prevalence is so low in that in that group. So it's important not to screen. You know, it'd be like screening a hundred women for testicular cancer. You might get one or two positives, (laughs) but they're likely to be negative, right? They're likely to be false. And the same thing applies to testing really young animals. Cushing's, that's a mistake. But once they sort of hit, you know, 10 years or more, or a little bit earlier if they're, if they're showing early signs of, of laminitis in particular, it's worth testing. And it's really important to remember that they don't have to have a long curly hair coat or anything like that to, to have Cushing's. Often the first sign of Cushing's is laminitis. But that type of laminitis that occurs with Cushing's and with, with insulin dysregulation can for a long time remain asymptomatic. So, and there are studies now showing that at least 50% of animals that have radiographic or so X-ray evidence of, of laminitis that have these problems like Cushing's disease don't have any history of lameness or anything like that. And by the time it's diagnosed, it's too late. So the important thing is screening tests from probably about 10 years of age in every horse and pony. And the most effective way to do it is what we call a TRH stimulation test. You can also do an ACTH baseline test on those horses as a, as a screen. That is quite reasonable. So to summarize, the two things that I would consider would be oral sugar test in, uh, you know, from two years of age onwards in, in high-risk animals, you know, ponies that are considered high-risk for this problem uh, in particular, and then Cushing's testing as a screen from probably 10 years onwards. And, and doing that yearly is, and doing both yearly is actually quite reasonable because what can happen, there's a lot of things that can affect insulin regulation in, in horses and ponies. And 
the most important one is just their genetics. It's just the way they are. But the other things that can affect them are obesity, so getting, getting fatter makes you more insulin resistant. You lose control over your insulin a bit more. Disease can push you one way or the other. And the other thing is just purely age. So as they get older, just as we get older, we get problems with insulin regulation. So do horses. So horses become insulin dysregulated as they get older naturally. So uh, it's worth keeping up with the testing. Yeah, and with the TRH stimulation test, I know at least where I am in the States that the seasonal rise of ACTH is, I don't know what, the end of July, maybe through December. And Mm -hmm. that's when all horses will have their ACTH naturally rise. And would you still do the TRH stim during that time? Yeah, you can do it. At the moment, there's not great information on just how much season affects the results of that. But, you know, I think it's reasonable to do either. And even in that, that kind of fall period, it's reasonable to do it just an ACTH baseline or a TRH stim. The TRH stim is you're still just measuring the same thing. You're measuring ACTH, but you're measuring it before and after giving this TRH. And what the TRH does is it makes them produce more of that ACTH, which happens even in normal horses and ponies. But uh, in horses and ponies that have an abnormal pituitary, that have Cushing's, they produce a lot more. And kind of like the oral sugar test, where you're just measuring insulin before and after oral sugar, kind of like that, it's just teasing out animals that have a problem with regulation by kind of stimulating that area of interest to make what we're what we're interested in and seeing if they make too much of it. So both of them are what we call dynamic tests, and these dynamic tests tend to be more accurate. So the oral sugar test and the TRH stint are definitely the most sensitive ways of, of diagnosing Cushing and insulin dysregulation in horses and bones. And how often should you test the ACTH to adjust pergolide? Is it just when symptoms are changing? So what we generally would do, if, if an animal is diagnosed with Cushing's and treated with pergolide, and pergolide is a very effective treatment for Cushing, what we'd normally do is start them on a fairly low dose and retest just their ACTH a, a month later or so and see if it's controlled. And then yearly is probably reasonable after that. And it's important to recognize that sometimes they need their dose adjusted, for sure, when they have Cushing's. So just because they've been on Bergolide and a test was done initially after starting it and looked like it was controlling it well. That doesn't mean a year down the track or two years down the track that that's still going to be the case. And you do see flares of laminitis in horses and ponies where their Cushing is no longer controlled by the current dose of pergolide. And so once you have that proper diagnosis of either the insulin dysregulation or PPID, what can owners do to prevent laminitis in these horses in the future? Well, the biggest thing is, with Cushing's, the biggest thing is treating effectively with pergolide. Make sure they get it and make sure follow-up testing indicates that the dose is, is effectively controlling their ACTH. With insulin dysregulation, if they're overweight and they have, particularly if they have a high kind of even just baseline insulin, those animals need to lose weight. And that, of course, can be not the easiest thing to do but things that can help, you know, exercise can, can help. But if they've got laminitis, it, it can be a little bit difficult. But walking exercise, placing feed at, at one end of, of a paddock, water at the other to make them walk is one way that, that people have used uh, structured walking exercise, uh, swimming, uh, other things. Probably most importantly, though, for those horses is, is diet. There are a lot of ways to approach diet, but probably the easiest way is to get a, a weight, a body weight that's accurate, even if you have to travel or somewhere to, to do it, and then feed them 1.5% of their body weight as hay and preferably as soaked hay to remove those soluble carbohydrates and with or without testing to make sure that those non-structural carbohydrates are less than about 10% is the way to go. And feeding 1.5% of their body weight as hay will guarantee you some weight loss if they don't have access to other feed. So it's a simple way to ensure that they lose weight, but they don't lose it too quickly. And it's important if you're soaking the hay and they don't have access to pasture to add some sort of vitamin, mineral balance it 
to their to the feet of which there are many available. Uh, weight loss in those cases is is really important, and diet is critical. The other thing that can help with weight loss is levothyroxine, thyro L. You know, vets can help work out a dose, and thyroxine can help some horses and ponies to lose weight. If they're not overweight, they just have a profound insulin response to oral sugar, which we see in you know, particular breeds like Welsh ponies and others. Sometimes they need some help with drugs, and probably the easiest and most readily available and most used in horses is metformin. So metformin as a oral treatment given 30 to 60 minutes before feeding can and definitely does reduce their insulin response. So given as a targeted medication around feeding time, just before feeding time, will help to reduce their insulin response. And you know, metformin is, uh, is definitely worth using in horses and ponies that have a really profound insulin response to ingested carbohydrate. And there are some other candidates on the horizon. There was this work done at Queensland on veloglyphosin, which was Martin Salanson and company. And that drug was effective in helping to reduce the insulin response to a carbohydrate challenge meal and, and help prevent laminitis in a, in a group of ponies in an experimental setting. So that is along similar lines to, to metformin. And there are a range of other drugs actually in use in human medicine that, that can do similar things. So the important thing for us is recognizing which horses and ponies are making too much insulin in response to ingested carbohydrate and then using medications to help animals reduce that response. The other supplement, I guess, or the one supplement that I think is probably there's a little bit of evidence for and it might be worthwhile is supplements that contain resveratrol. So this resveratrol is what we call a polyphenol and it has some bona fide effects on reducing insulin resistance, particularly in horses. The evidence that it's helpful is pretty scant, but it's unlikely to be detrimental and it may well have some positive effects for these horses and ponies. So a supplement that contains resveratrol is, and there's a couple out there, is probably also a reasonable step in, in horses and ponies that are prone to this problem. My name is Candace Perino, and I have taken the role on from not only a horse owner who has rehabbed her personal horse from founder and laminitis to now a full-time barefoot trimmer. So, you know, my personal horse, his, his affection name is Shark. He had actually suffered from founder a few degrees of rotation, and he was very lame. You know, he's on a horrible diet. And I was at such a loss because vets had never really guided me of how to prevent and or even rehab him. So I started doing a whole bunch of research myself and looking into everything. And as an owner, I felt that it was in my horse's best interest to just really be an advocate for him and try to learn as much as possible. And because I was so passionate about my relationship with my horse and he just means the world to me, I really wanted to try to help him as best I can. You know, with doing that, I reached out to several different articles, research, webinars, clinics, you know, Pete Ramey's DVDs, his clinic, um, Ida Hammer's clinics. So I tried to just reach and reach and reach until I had everything at my hands and just tried everything. I had vet do radiographs and started with there and implemented a better diet and, you know, introduced vitamins and minerals to him and took out grass and I implemented what's called a track system, which encourages movement. And as soon as I implemented this track system with different hay net stations and uh, water area and with him and some buddies, it created more movement. He was able to move as he pleased, you know, comfort level wise. And, you know, I saw the biggest change in his feet and even his behavior right then and there after probably within a couple of weeks just being on that track system itself um, not even you know waiting for the diet to really kick in after a couple months it was really the movement is what i believe set him up for success and 
we were able to actually start riding again and we started doing trail rides about eight miles worth in one session. So he recovered from his founder and we were able to ride again probably within 12 months and he gained so much soul depth and some concavity and he was so much happier. And with the, you had mentioned Thyro L with horses that were overweight. And I think I, I remember you saying in your talk that that should only be for a time or for. A yeah, state. I mean, probably just to help them get their weight under control. And that's probably how most people use it rather than for life. We're not 100% sure either way on the long term side effects of thyroxin supplementation in horses. And there are some people that express concern. Uh, you know, I don't think there's any evidence that it is damaging, but, you know, I think it probably makes the most sense as a short to medium term assistance in losing weight for horses and ponies. And what about horses that aren't overweight but do have the insulin dysregulation? I think it still makes sense for sure to minimize the amount of non structural carbohydrate or sugar simple-ish carbohydrate in their diet. So I think low carbohydrate is the way to go, for sure, uh, in, in horses that have insulin dysregulation, whether they're overweight or not. Yeah. And you mentioned soaking hay. And I know when you were talking at the NEAP that you had said there, you know, you had specified the best ways or lengths of time to soak hay. Yeah. A lot of the evidence that comes out of England suggests that you need to soak it overnight. There's a bit of evidence from the U.S. showing after about two hours, you don't get a lot more benefit in terms of getting rid of a lot of sugar. So the keys for hay soaking are make sure there's enough water. So, you know, if you're soaking quarter bale of hay or something like that, you probably want, you know, 10 gallons or so of water really to do that. And then secondly, if uh, it's really temperature dependent, so... If it's very cold and you're doing it outside or or in an unheated barn in winter, it probably is safer to soak overnight in those situations because when the temperature is low, the effectiveness of soaking really reduces pretty markedly. But if it's warm in summer, you know, spring, most of fall, and you've got enough water, you probably don't need more than a couple of hours really of soaking to minimize the sugar content. But the bottom line is if you really want to be sure, it's worth getting it tested. You can get the hay tested pre and post soaking and just make sure that it is getting rid of the sugar. Yeah, and so I have a horse and I'm always looking at ways to reduce sugars in his diet, even though he's not metabolic in any way. But when I transition him to grass during certain times of year, I always get just a little bit nervous and I'm really cautious as I do it. And you had mentioned during one of your talks, the times of day or times of year that the sugar in the grass fluctuates. And can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it's a little bit difficult, I guess, that times of day, if you consider that grass and other plants make sugar using sunlight, then it makes sense that at the end of a period of sunlight that they will have stored the most sugar. So that means that afternoon and early evening are probably times when the grass is going to have the most carbohydrate stored in general. So avoiding afternoon and early evening grazing, it makes the most sense. Whereas late night, early morning grazing is probably the safest for horses and ponies. But uh, grass is a great unknown, I think, and it's always a little bit of a lottery and you can't really you know, practically test it frequently. So what that means is that you know, putting horses and ponies out on, on grass and on, on pasture is always going to be something that's harder to control how much carbohydrate they get out of that situation. And during one of your talks, did you mention the use of anti-inflammatories or NSAIDs in metabolic laminitis that they might not be really useful As a treatment, you know, I don't think they change the course of the disease. And we all probably agree on that, that we're using them more as a pain relief. But as as something that will change the course of the disease, yeah, not, not particularly useful. Yeah. Hi, my name is Ann Ramsey, and I graduated from Cal Poly with an animal science degree. And I have been a hoof care practitioner for about 15 years. Um, I do a lot of therapeutic casework, and I'm also certified in equine rehabilitation. 
what I sort of say is laminitis is a little bit like a bomb going off in the foot. And then what we're trying to do is survey the damage after the fire burns through and then see how many attachments can we get back. For me, I think of laminitis as this really broad spectrum. Like some of the horses, it's their first insult, they're younger animals, you fix their diet, you get it under control, um, their pain is not outrageous, you can manage it at home. Those are pretty, you kind of cruise through, like you and the vet kind of know what to expect. But some animals will have a lot less structural damage and, and be really in agony. And then other animals, they're kind of running around on subluxated joints and they're not that painful. You know, as a practitioner over the last 15 years, what I've really tried to think about are two key factors for success. The first is structural damage and how can we repair that through diet, through trimming, etc. And the second is pain control, pain management. And I really try to be conscious about making sure that an animal can be comfortable throughout treatment. And so if I feel that we can't adequately manage their pain in the field, then I, I've taken a harder stance about referring them to the hospital. So those were my main questions about laminitis, but for, you know, a little bit of a more personal question, if you had, you know, more time and the funding, what would you look into and research more? Well, I think the the problem we face in laminitis is that it's hard to learn anything about it without causing it experimentally. And that's been a really difficult thing for us over the years because it's obviously very ethically difficult for us to pursue those types of experiments. We don't want to do that. You know, I I think what we're trying to set up here at the moment is a way of looking at and researching what's going on in the tissue of the foot without using live horses. And so we're actually trying to do that with cadaver limbs from horses that are recently deceased for unrelated reasons that we we get in the hospital here. And what we're trying to do, it's, it's kind of been done a little bit before, but nobody's ever really incorporated limb load into that at the same time. So what we're really trying to do at the moment is set up a realistic simulation using cadaver limbs that doesn't require the use of live horses that we can really use to drill down on what mechanisms are at play and how we can prevent those mechanisms in different forms of this disease. And, you know, I think that's our dream here is that we could have a a way of working out exactly what's going on and efficiently and effectively testing interventions uh, without having to use live horses. That's that's really our, our goal. In other diseases, they often use cultured cells in a lab to do that. And there's been some attempts to culture the lamella epithelial cells before, and they're really difficult to culture. But the other issue for us is that we're really, you know, this disease is essentially a breakdown in the connections between the cells. And so we really need almost the whole organ to do that, you know, to look at how different things affect those connections. And so that's why we're really keen to pursue this limb model here. And we think it will lead to a much more rapid increase in knowledge in this area. I mean, one thing to just as a follow on to that is to realize is that laminitis is, is a problem with a complexity that's similar to cancer. You know, it's, it's multifactorial. It's unmatched in, in humans, which means that we're kind of on our own in terms of working out what's going on and you know, even though tens of billions of billions of dollars are directed towards something like cancer research, you know, we're we're working on, you know, tens of thousands of dollars often in the laminitis research sphere. So two things there is uh, one, it's kind of tough going, I guess, and that's why progress is slow. Although I think we've made some leaps over the last 20 years. But the other thing is we do rely a lot on donations and small amounts of, of, of funds. So uh, for anyone listening, if they're interested in making a contribution, look us up on the web and uh, email me. And uh, Small amounts of money go a long way in, in this. Uh, it, people are often surprised at what you can do, but a lot of these studies, they cost you know, $10,000, $20,000 to get done, and some of them much more than that. Yeah, money is, is always a factor in this in this field, and there's such a small group of us researching it. So every little bit helps. Yeah. So, yeah, I just have one more question. So... As uh-huh. we are wrapping up, do you have any final tips for horse owners or hoof care providers or even veterinarians working with a laminated horse? Yeah, well, I mean, even backing up further from that, I think prevention is, is the key. And 
early recognition of horses and ponies that are at risk and trying to treat it's always going to be difficult. Preventing it is is everything. So early recognition of, of insulin dysregulation in particular, Cushing's in particular, and then appropriate management and treatment is really important. For acute episodes, cooling and not letting them do too much too early. If, even if they're looking fairly happy, make sure we stick on the conservative side. And then for chronic management, addressing underlying endocrine problems. So making sure Cushing's, if, if they're already, even if they're already being treated, making sure that's controlled, making sure their insulin is controlled well, because it's very hard to stabilize horses with chronic laminitis if they've got persistent underlying uncontrolled endocrine issues. And then it's not always possible and not always easy, but finding a good vet, farrier, hoof care, a foot care team that'll work together is it's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, thank you so much for your time. Sure. Well, thanks. It was nice to talk to you. Yeah, today, you Alicia. too. Have a great Cheers. day. <laughs> you too. See ya. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Hi, my name is Daisy Bicking, and I am a farrier hoof care provider. Uh, I focus my work on rehabilitation and predominantly rehabilitation of laminitic horses. To me, the most important part of rehabilitation, because laminitic horses present in so many different ways and their problems can be very diverse depending on the incidenting cause and the situation at home and all the variables that go into the individual animal, the most important component is that every member of the animal's care team is working on the same page, meaning that the veterinarian, the owner, the hoof care provider, the barn manager, the trainer, the massage therapist, the dentist, or any of these people that might be involved in helping this horse are all in basic agreement on how the horse's rehabilitation should be managed. There's nothing worse than when you have a horse that's in trouble and the veterinarian is recommending one protocol, the farrier hoof care provider is recommending a completely different protocol, and then you get someone like the trainer who has even a different opinion. So ultimately, that care team is decided by the owner, but sometimes the owner doesn't have the best information on how to select that team. The very best thing that you can do is be a good communicator to the other people involved in helping that horse. Be open-minded, be educated in your own role and what else is available to help that horse and discuss things in a professional and timely manner with the other team members. That gives you the best chance of success. If any one team member is on a different page, then that needs to be discussed openly without criticism so that the horse can get the best care without putting anybody in the middle or critiquing anybody unfairly. I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.